Okay, so it's 535 and we appreciate all of you who have made an effort to be here tonight. Um, good evening and we want to welcome everyone to our event. I'm Heidi Weller, Executive Committee Member of Yale Women of Northern California Chapter and joining me is Jean Mirasek, Co-Chair of the Bay Area Chapter of the Yale Alumni Nonprofit Alliance. We're co-hosting this event the third in a Yale Women's series on crime and justice featuring Judge Lisa Perlman. For our Bay Area alum, we encourage you to sign up to our newsletter. If you're interested in coming to Bay Area Yale Women events and check out the events we continue to host. As a brief review for this evening, we'll take questions in the chat during the presentation and reply to as many as feasible following the talk. At 6.30, we'll view a short clip of Judge Perlman's documentary project work sample. Please note, for your chats this evening, we'd like you to direct them to, to Jean Marisek. She'll be one of the co-hosts in your chat. So Jean will be looking at our questions. Uh, lastly, a recording of tonight's event will be sent to all registered attendees. And for the best viewing experience, we do recommend setting your Zoom view to speaker. And now, for the big event, uh, I want to introduce retired judge and award-winning author and documentary film producer, Lisa Perlman. So a little bit oh. about Judge Perlman. She's riveted audiences across the country sharing her own and others' insights on how to fix our current broken justice system. Her talk features the world-changing true story of the 1968 death penalty trial of Black Panther Party co-founder Huey Newton its surprising outcome that likely prevented national riots and the pioneering woman defense lawyer who won his freedom. Judge Perlman has been recognized as the leading national expert on that internationally watched murder trial. Her first book, The Sky's the Limit, People v. Newton, The Real Trial of the 21st Century, was an international book awards for books on law and was a finalist for books on US history and multiculturalism. Attending a Yale and Hollywood conference in 2013 prompted Judge Perlman to undertake the documentary project, American Justice on Trial, People v. Newton, a sample of which later won the Berkeley Film Foundation Civil Rights Award. The ongoing film project involves several Yale classmates, including Barry Sheck of The Innocence Project and composer John Lissauer. The honorary committee includes Kurt Schmoke and Henry Chaussey. We get to view the film project sample at the program's end tonight at 6.30. Judge Perlman also made a cameo appearance in director Stanley Nelson's acclaimed 2015 PBS film, The Black Panthers, Vanguard of the Revolution, commenting on the jury verdict in the Newton trial. In 2016, Judge Perlman completed a book to the film project to incorporate interviews of surviving trial participants and experts on criminal justice, including Equal Justice Initiative Director, Brian Stevenson, that won numerous prizes. In 2018, she published a biography of Newton attorney, Faye Stender, that won an International Book Award for biographies. Tonight, she is delighted to share with us everything that she has learned. And with that, welcome Lisa. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you to Yale Women of Northern California for including me in your crime and justice series. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, next, uh, please. Okay, so we're gonna focus on two of my books, um, Call Me Phaedra and American Justice on Trial. And I can't say I'm gonna tell you everything I learned because uh, it took too long, but I will hit the highlights. Next. So today we're very familiar with a number of disturbing incidents involving um, young black men and sometimes a black woman uh, killed by the police. Uh, and this is an ongoing trial right now uh, for the uh, policeman who killed George Floyd. So one of the things we learned when we were filming was that uh, Kathleen Cleaver said that um, they were the grandparents of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it did remind me, and I think others of my age, of 1968 and the Huey Newton trial 
which was a murder trial, but it was the opposite. It was a black man who was accused of murdering a policeman. Next. In 2016, the uh, Oakland Museum of California hosted a, a huge exhibit uh, it, dedicated to the Black Panthers um, on their 50th anniversary. And it was the most, uh, wide, uh, most um, widely attended event in the history of the museum. And they extended the program um, because there were so many people who really wanted to see uh, about uh, what the history was about and the impact that they had, uh, there's tremendous impact on the community for a variety of reasons, including um, getting a um, civilian review of the police uh, in, instituted in Oakland. Next. One of the things that happened during that year was the mayor of Oakland uh, dedicated a grove in Defremery Park, which is where the Panthers used to meet in Oakland, uh, to the memory of Bobby Hutton, who was their first recruit. He was 17 years old and he was killed by the police as he was surrendering after a confrontation in the spring of 68. And that was what really galvanized community support for the Panthers. Uh, and nothing happened at the time um, to investigate the police conduct. Next. Well, back in September of 1966, there was an incident involving a teenager as well who was killed in San Francisco um, after being accused of uh, joyriding. Um, and it caused riots in San Francisco. And that was what prompted Bobby Seale and Huey Newton to start the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in Oakland, uh, which was only one of many Black Panther parties across the country in inner cities, all of them inspired by Stokely Carmichael's Voting Rights um, Association in uh, Lowndes County, Alabama, which had a Black Panther for its symbol. Uh, Huey Newton is there carrying a rifle, and they were the only organization, the Panthers of Oakland, that carried weapons, loaded weapons, uh, which was legal at the time, uh, which distinguished them from all the others. Next. Well, I want to go back to the background of what, why they were created and what was going on. Uh, before World War II, there was a very small population of Blacks among the uh, Oaklanders and in Berkeley and Richmond, it was almost non-existent. Uh, next. During World War II, uh, President Roosevelt joined forces with industrialist Henry Kaiser um, to help the shipbuilding industry for the war by uh, issuing an executive order that banned discrimination in hiring by the defense industries. And that caused 500,000 uh, people to move from the South, most, mostly Black, um, to the Bay Area and other parts of California uh, in the Great Migration. Next. So the population essentially quadrupled. Um, in, and in Richmond, it was an 8,000% increase. And the housing they had was considered temporary public housing because the, back, the white politicians uh, thought that, the, that after the war, uh, they would just go back to the South. Uh, which did not happen. When the Kaiser shipyards closed in 1945 at the war's end, all these people stayed. A lot of them had no jobs. Um, and uh, it became a festering issue that, that, that was caused by the uh, political situation. Next. So in LA, it was a very similar situation. And after 20 years, um, the, there was an eruption in Watts in the Los Angeles area um, a confrontation with police that caused millions of dollars worth of damage and numerous injuries. And it was a concern to the president, uh, Lyndon Johnson, that this was going to happen um, in cities across the country. And he wanted to do something to prevent that. Uh, next. So one of the cities he focused on, a prime city he focused on, was Oakland. Oakland, since its founding, uh, was primarily controlled by Republicans. For the last 50 years, the mayor of Oakland had been a Republican and always been um, the one chosen by the Nolan family that owned the Oakland Tribune. If they endorsed someone, he became mayor. And if you look at uh, the picture there of John Houlihan, who was mayor from 61 to 66, he was the attorney for the Tribune. Next. 
So the people that were sent out from Washington when LBJ got Congress to invest in a huge federal jobs program for inner city youth uh, was Amory Bradford, who was actually a Yaley uh, undergrad and law school and focused on trying to make sure that Oakland didn't become another Watts. And he was working on a book throughout that time that he would publish in 1968. Next. The reason Oakland seemed like a good place to try the experiment of the jobs was that it had a longstanding middle class, unlike most other cities. The Pullman trains um, had their terminus in Oakland, and the porters were all black by, by rule, by the uh, decree of, of Mr. Pullman, and they lived in Oakland. Um, and they created the first um, union of Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in the late 20s. Um, and the uncle of Ron Dellums, who became a longtime congressman from Oakland, uh, was one of the founders. And Oakland also had in uh, Judge Lionel Wilson on the uh, county bench, which was very unusual then to have a black judge on the bench, and also the first black member elected uh, to uh, the state assembly uh, from Berkeley. Uh, next. So in June of 1966, um, Martin Luther King uh, was uh, on one of his many marches um, with Stokely Carmichael, who was the head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that King had created, and they split. In, in this particular march, there was a sniper who attacked the, the leader of the march, and Stokely Carmichael used that as the premise for breaking with the nonviolence of Dr. King and urging black power and actually um, deciding that he did not even want any white supporters in their movement anymore. Next. So by the fall of that year is when um, another incident prompted the creation of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in Oakland. And what the, what the Panthers did at that point was that they followed, there were only a, a dozen or so of them total, uh, they would get in cars and follow the police around on their beat in the flatlands of Oakland. And when police arrested someone, Huey would get out and the other Panthers would protect them protect him with their rifles and he would take his law book and he would go up to the police officer and the arrestee and read the arrestee his rights. Huey had just gone to a night school uh, to take classes on California gun law and so he knew that you could hold it straight up or straight down within city limits and that was okay. He also had studied the, the, the new Warren Court rulings including the Miranda rights um, and he was read those to the um, arrestee, much to the chagrin of the police. Uh, next. Oh, I, I do want to mention that the person who taught him that was Ed Meese, who was also a Yaley. Uh, he became the attorney general under Reagan. Okay, so by the spring of 1967, when there was another incident, this time in Richmond, where uh, a young man in his 20s was killed by a, a deputy sheriff, uh, the Panthers used that as the focus of their first newspaper, and they started uh, reaching out to the community of Richmond as well as Oakland, and they decided that what they wanted to do was to um, sell as many papers as possible to fund their organization and gain as many members as they could, and it became the principal fundraising tool was their paper. Uh, next. Well, the following month in May of 1967, uh, a local assemblyman um, who had heard of the Panthers by then, uh, heard Newton on the radio, uh, decided that this was a danger to, um, to the community. And he uh, sponsored a bill uh, that was nicknamed the Panther Bill to prevent anyone from carrying a loaded weapon within city limits anywhere in the state. Um, and it got the backing of the NRA at that time and uh, of course, Governor Reagan and the Panthers decided that what they would do is show up um, at the hearing for that bill and oppose it, just like any other citizen had a right to do. Only they showed up in a caravan with Denzel Dowell's family. There were about 30 of them together with their friends and they had their guns um, pointed straight up or straight down and they entered um, the Capitol building and freaked out the assembly. Um, 
and were not prohibited from coming in. In fact, NRA members had been at prior hearings carrying weapons and nobody had ever said anything. Um, but as they left and they got in their cars, the police followed them and arrested them for a variety of charges like not having a, um, their sticker on their license plate or a uh, taillight that was out. Um, and so several of them did get arrested on the way out. In the meantime, this passed with, uh, very quickly and became emergency legislation signed into law by Governor Reagan in June of 67. Uh, and it created, uh, uh, let me just finish by saying, it made California the, the state with the most stringent um, uh, gun laws in the country. Next. Okay, so during that summer, um, there were uh, demonstrations and riots uh, throughout the country in major cities. And it wasn't um, just that summer, it happened in 66 as well after the Watts riots. So, so Johnson was right to anticipate such things. Uh, next, but it didn't happen in Oakland. And so they were really proud of the fact that they'd started this jobs program and maybe that would prevent um, Oakland from being one of them. Next. Okay, Oakland was also uh, the center along with Berkeley of the anti-war movement. And this is the middle of the Vietnam War and opposition to the draft. There was an induction center in Oakland. It was the second largest one in the state. And what they did was they blocked entrance to it and there were thousands of demonstrators. And in opposition to that, the Oakland police had support from all the local police uh, from different communities plus state police. And there were numerous arrests um, in Stop the Draft Week. Uh, and it was a huge confrontation that had not uh, occurred uh, before in Oakland. Uh, so next, this is two weeks later. Um, Huey Newton is in a confrontation with two policemen early morning, uh, pre-dawn, um, and it's a, a, a shooting. And one policeman died, um, another one was severely wounded, and Newton was severely wounded. When the backup police came, they only found uh, uh, that the, the policemen's guns, they didn't find any gun um, uh, that Hewton, they thought Huey Newton had used, but uh, Huey Newton and his passenger had fled the scene already. They found him at the hospital um, on his way into surgery, and this picture was taken by a newspaper photographer, and it became the... Um, uh, Panther's method of getting community support because he's shackled to the gurney in obvious pain um, on his way into life-saving surgery. And the question they raised uh, using a bullhorn around the neighborhoods was, can a black man get a fair trial in America defending his life against a white policeman? Uh, next. By February of 1968, while Newton was in jail uh, facing a death penalty trial, um, they had a huge fundraiser in Oakland. Bobby Seale is uh, featured on the left and on the right are the leadership of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was no longer committed to nonviolence, uh, who had flown out from Atlanta for this event. And speech after speech, they uh, talked about Huey as if he were already dead or slated for death because they had never heard of a black man who killed a white policeman ever not getting the death penalty. And they said, if he dies, the sky's the limit uh, in retaliation. Uh, next. Well, within a month and a half after that, Martin Luther King was assassinated and there were spontaneous riots in 125 cities with 60,000 National Guardsmen called to quell those riots. So what happened as a result of that was there was a reaction in Oakland uh, next where Eldridge Cleaver, who had now joined the Panthers, he'd just been released recently from prison himself, uh, he and Bobby Hutton and a, a few others went looking for trouble with the Oakland police and found some. And there was a, uh, a shootout. And at the end of it, uh, several of them surrendered. And then ultimately Eldridge Cleaver and Bobby Hutton were in the act of uh, surrendering. And Cleaver was smart enough from having spent nine years in prison to strip naked and come out. So they knew he didn't have a weapon. And Bobby Hutton was too shy. So when he came out wearing a trench coat and kind of hunched over, he was uh, hit with a barrage of about 19 bullets and died instantly. And that was what galvanized community support for the Panthers in the black community uh, in Berkeley and Oakland. 
next. So the question, of course, wait a minute back. This question was, is Oakland really not for burning? It, it was, uh, there was a lot of polarization over this um, shooting um, and the trial that was scheduled for May uh, of Huey Newton had to be postponed because uh, they didn't expect to get a fair jury if they picked one in May. Next. Then uh, when it was scheduled for June, um, Bobby Kennedy, who was running for president, was assassinated in Los Angeles, and the trial was again postponed um, until July, and the question was again raised. Um, next, is uh, Oakland's not for burning? Um, next one. The trial judge was Judge Monroe Friedman, was the last case before he retired, um, and he was committed to uh, being as fair as possible as he could in this really volatile situation. And at every hearing, pre-trial hearing, uh, there had been Panthers and actually supporters from the anti-war movement joined together um, demonstrating um, on behalf of uh, Huey Newton. Uh, next. Uh, the prosecutor was D. Lowell Jensen, who was the top prosecutor in the office, and he was also slated to try the uh, Oakland Seven, who were the leadership of the uh, anti-war protests that was going to be tried the following year. Um, Jensen was also committed to trying to be as fair as possible in this trial, which was both of those were major factors. Uh, next. So what happened? Well, I want to share with you uh, uh, the photos of Charles Gary and Faye Stender, who were the defense attorneys, and I'll do that in a little bit. But their effort was to uh, make sure that you didn't have the traditional jury of one's peers um, that uh, supposedly was a constitutional guarantee in the Sixth Amendment, but in, but in reality for 200 years was traditionally all white men. And they knew that would be a disaster for Newton. So they worked really hard. Uh, Faye Stender uh, coordinated with uh, professors from Cal um, in sociology uh, with a list of over 300 questions to elicit bias. Um, uh, and this is all rep very new. Um, to the court system. They hadn't seen this kind of thing being done before. They had witnesses uh, before the trial started to educate the judge that he allowed about uh, essentially implicit bias. Um, and that helped um, them set the stage for uh, getting the judge to, um, to excuse for cause several white men who probably would not have been excused by another judge um, or under different circumstances. Now, Charles Gary was the opposite of Faye Stender. She had been a Supreme Court clerk and was very schooled in the latest law and the, uh, from the Warren Court. He was more a shoot from the hip, old fashioned lawyer, but he'd never lost a client to the death penalty, um, was very famous for his criminal defense. And he asked questions that nobody else had ever thought about asking jurors, potential jurors, mostly lawyers, defense lawyers back then just took the first 12 people that didn't appear to have two, you know, two heads or were openly biased. Um, he would challenge potential jurors. And as a consequence, they got seven women and five men, only two of the men were white. One of them was black, one was a Cuban American and one was a Japanese American. Among the women, there was one Latina and one woman married to a Latino. Uh, this was revolutionary for a death penalty trial. It was not what the Panthers wanted. The Panthers wanted a jury of people from the flatlands, um, blacks and Latinos mostly, uh, that they thought were their peers. And the judge explained to them that uh, if that were the case, then if you had a hell's angel on trial, they would want a jury of bikers. It's not the way a cross section of the community um, ought to work. Uh, next. So the jury chose banker David Harper as the foreman, the first known black uh, foreman of a major murder trial in America. And he actually manipulated to get them to do that. He, he spent a lot of time during the trial um, making friends with the women, playing cards with the women, because he hoped to be named the foreman when they uh, deliberated. And he did that because he felt that he could do justice and he was willing to risk his life because it was threatened by both the Panthers and the police um, to, in order to do justice. Um, next. Uh, here are the reactions uh, to uh, David Harper being named. 
Uh, they didn't really know how to report it. Uh, federal Judge Felton Henderson, who's now retired, was then a young civil rights lawyer. He said it was completely revolutionary. Um, it was just unheard of. Uh, next. So at the same time, J. Edgar Hoover is just starting to notice the Panthers, which weren't a very big organization at that time, but were getting branches started in other uh, communities so as, uh, because the Panthers were getting so much publicity for this trial. And he, he decided they were the number one internal threat to American security. He did target them, but they really weren't the number one internal threat to American security. Uh, next. So in the late summer of 1968, Bradford finally published his book. And what's interesting about it is he does not even mention this trial, which was the primary source that might make sure that Oakland was actually for burning. Um, next. So that raised that question. Um, as the trial drew to a close, and Newton testified and he mesmerized everybody with his testimony. He talked about the history of racism in America, which the judge allowed him to do. Um, and he talked about blacking out during the, the shooting and that he didn't have a gun um, and that the policeman had been abusive in um, stopping him and frisking him. Um, it, the DA thought that there was enough evidence to say that Huey Newton must have had a gun and that he shot first. And so you had two different versions that went to the jury um, for them to deliberate over. Next. Well, the day before the jury came back, um, Lowell Jensen told me uh, you could have heard a pin drop all, in all of Oakland. There wasn't even very much crime going on that, they, that the police noticed. Um, and here is the Panther paper coming out and they're expecting the sky's the limit. Um, they've got Huey Newton's photo with a rifle under it. As I said, people are still anticipating the death penalty. Next. Um, so you still have question, is Oakland really going to come to a point where it's going to boil over into riots that turn into national riots? Well, that's not what the jury did. Under Harper's leadership, they focused on the evidence um, and they decided that uh, Newton did not have a gun, um, and, but he overreacted to the police instigating um, the uh, shooting um, and that therefore he was guilty of voluntary manslaughter. Uh, and it was unclear who won or who lost, but it was an accepted result um, in the community. Next. The post-verdict damage, the only damage that was done was by two drunk policemen in the middle of the night who shot up the Panther headquarters, uh, as a result of which, uh, next, the police chief uh, immediately suspended them and then fired them because he was so concerned that they would prompt the riots that they had just barely avoided. Next. So the following year, Ann Fagan Ginger, who uh, was running the Mickle John Civil Rights Institute in Berkeley, which chronicled uh, cases involving um, racial issues and civil rights, um, decided to put together a book, a handbook called Minimizing Racism in Jury Trials uh, that was published by the National Lawyers Guild. And it was a how-to book for other uh, defense lawyers um, to use to try to replicate what, the, um, what was done in Newton's case by his defense counsel uh, to create a jury uh, that was um, both mixed race and uh, included a fair number of women, um, majority of women. Um, and it did. And so we can date to this case and to that book, the um, movement thereafter to have uh, diverse juries across the country that we often take for granted today. Next. Well, he was in jail still. And while he was in jail pending appeal, uh, Faye Stender became his principal counsel uh, on appeal. She wrote a brilliant brief and got the um, conviction reversed on three technicalities. And he was um, sent back for retrial. This is a photo of the day he was released on bond. Um, and that is uh, Faye Stender and uh, Charles Gary with uh, Huey Newton. Um, and this was phenomenal. The fact that he was freed uh, was just shocking to the world and amazing to his followers. Face Stender became instantly uh, famous as a movement lawyer uh, internationally. Um, next. 
So here we are today, and there's the history of white male um, district attorneys. And now we have Nancy O'Malley as our district attorney. And we interviewed her for the film. And what she said was really, um, to me, the most significant thing. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Um, and that's why you need diversity um, in both the prosecutor's office and the public defender's office in the police uh, um, uh, and the judges on the bench um, and all through the justice system because it gets you not only to fairer results because uh, they found that with uh, diverse juries, um, they deliberate longer and come to uh, more defensible results than non-diverse juries do, but it also gets you community buy-in because the community feels that you are really trying to do justice for all parts of the community and they don't feel like there's an us-them uh, component to it as much as they did um, before. Uh, next. So here we are. And I think that for any place in the country, um, the, uh, there are uh, still issues um, of lack of diversity throughout the system, which is a huge factor in how the police um, interact with, um, with, with Blacks in the community, how they interact with others, um, you know, uh, Latinos in the community, and um, essentially how decisions are made by prosecutors and judges. One of the people in our film, Brian Stevenson, pointed out that still nationally, over 80% of prosecutors are white male, and the same is true of judges. Uh, so even though in the Bay Area, we have a great diversity on the bench and in the prosecutor and public defender's offices, and we have diversity in the, in the police department, that is not true in many locations. And that is something that the federal government will probably be working on again. They were doing that under the Obama administration with consent decrees with uh, police departments, but that ended during the Trump administration and is now um, probably coming back to try to reform the police to actually have um, uh, a much better uh, community relations and approach to uh, policing the community. There are two different um, models. One of them is the historic model of the police being um, uh, an us them, uh, where they are the warriors defending the, the uh, property owners in the community. And the other is the more modern uh, model, which is guardians of the community on behalf of the entire community. And in places where they've adopted that, um, that's where the police sometimes go out and play basketball with, uh, with kids on their beat or otherwise try to interact with picnics or uh, um, try to get the community to understand that they're there for everybody. Next. So I mentioned that I wrote a book about um, a face Stender, and it wasn't just this case that prompted her uh, international fame. She went straight from this case to representing uh, George Jackson, who was a revolutionary in maximum security at Soldad, who was accused of killing a guard. And she got his book um, published, um, it, it became an international bestseller. She represented him in a change of venue, which doesn't sound all that exciting, except in Monterey County, they'd never granted one before. And Monterey County was a very conservative community and there was no chance for him or his co-defendants not to get the death penalty in that county. She got it moved to San Francisco um, with her co-counsel, unheard of. Um, and and uh, Ginger wrote a book called The Relevant Lawyers. Uh, one chapter is devoted to Faye Stender. Uh, she also went on from, from there to work on women's rights and lesbian uh, custody um, rights. Uh, and the biggest thing she accomplished was with the prisoners' rights movement, which she practically founded at her desk. So I invite you to read about her. She also met a tragic end and uh, She's an example of someone who is an extraordinary activist, but also did not recognize boundaries very well to her own detriment. So I, um, let's move, I don't think we're, we'll move on to questions now. I think that's where we are. Yes, it is. Thank you so much, Judge Perlson. I'm going to ask Jean to join us now, and she has had the chance to monitor your questions in the chat, and she's going to be directing them to Judge Perlson. Yes. Can we uh, put Judge Perlman on? Yeah, perfect. 
Yeah. Pearl. Okay, I have a bunch of questions for you. You know, I, I'm thinking, does it really take 50 years before we can stand back and think about these issues and talk about them? And here we are. And yeah, they're still very much alive, but maybe we're ready to look at, you know, the ways in which our democratic institutions fell short then, still fall short now, and so on. But I want to get to the questions. Uh, the first one uh, is, uh, I'll, I'll read it, whoops. Um, the Panthers desire for a journey of flatland, jury of flatlanders, and you may need to say what flatlanders are for people who are the not from Oakland. Area, uh, from Oakland um, the, the flatlands are where the poorer people live. Okay. The Panthers desire for a jury of flatlanders points to the issue of economic disparity on juries. In Kern County, for example, poor people of all races are disadvantaged by lack of economic diversity on juries. Do you have any thoughts? Absolutely. In fact, I wanted to mention during the talk, and I thought there would be an opportunity during the Q&A, is that the jury diversity is not complete. Uh, because in a long trial, like Newton's trial, which was two months, uh, you would you would have to excuse for cause anybody who was poor, pretty much, because they would it, it would be a hardship. They only paid five dollars a day back then. They only pay fifteen dollars a day right now, and so that would that's a big issue. Uh, the economic hardship prevents a lot of people from from um, being on a jury. But aside from that, there's still an issue today about uh, the use of peremptory challenges. One of the remarkable things about Jensen was that he did not use five challenges he could have used to make that jury have more white men on it. He chose not to because he wanted community buy-in. But there are prosecutors across country to this day who use proxies. They're not allowed by Supreme Court decision to use race as a reason for exercising a peremptory challenge. But instead, what they do is they say, oh, dreadlocks, uh, that might be somebody who uses drugs. Or this person comes from a neighborhood, like a, somewhere in the flatlands. I'm going to excuse him for that reason. So California, just in the past year, uh, under the leadership of someone local here, Brendan Woods, who's in the Alameda County Public Defender's Office, um, among others who, who worked on this, we have a new bill going into effect in January of next year that's going to block peremptory challenges for a number of reasons, including how a prospective juror dresses, what neighborhood they live in, uh, their their distrust of law enforcement, um, that they speak another language, or they have a child outside of marriage, or, or receive benefits from the state. So there are a number of issues like that, but there's another one that you're pointing to, and that is there's a pro proposal that has not yet been um, passed to um, compensate jurors at minimum wage um, so that poor people can serve on juries um, without having an economic hardship. Uh, I have a bunch of questions here that are about Faye Stender, and I, I only know a little bit about her, but she certainly seems amazing. Um, one question is very simple, what happened to her? And that's very tragic, but others are sort of more broadly. Um, can you comment on the, the defense work, the, the, the work she did on the, defense, um, on the defense team and talk a little bit about who gets the credit for that victory? Oh, experts um, who we interviewed uh, who were there, like um, uh, Penny Cooper, who is a Hall of Fame criminal defense lawyer in California and was in the public defender's office at the time and observed part of the trial, gives face standard equal credit with Charles Gary for the result. Um, she was phenomenal. Uh, she worked 24 hours a day practically during that trial, um, but uh, she was responsible for all the legal motions that um, were filed. Uh, she did not appear in front of the jury. Um, that was Charles Gary's part of it. But she did, um, uh, she kept all the notes. She made, uh, she's the one who had made sure they had the issues prepared for appeal. Um, she was uh, hugely instrumental in that, um, in the result of that trial. And can you talk about in the long term, what impact did she have? on the legal system, on questions of the questions of uh, you know, incarceration and so on? Well, she had a, a 
a major impact, um, as I mentioned um, in the uh, Soldad Brothers case, uh, uh, George Jackson himself tried to break out of prison and was killed before trial, but his two co-defendants were tried in San Francisco and acquitted, and that would not have happened but for the work that she led to get them uh, that change of venue. So there, that was one. She also uh, worked on um, a prisoner's rights movement on constitutional rights of maximum security prisoners and other prisoners. And she talked lawyers in large firms uh, into doing pro bono um, for prisoners, which wasn't going on before that. She also got law schools to start clinics. She worked, she taught a seminar at uh, Berkeley Law um, and was one of the first. And now they have them regularly. So the Innocence Project has um, people working in the law schools um, uh, trying to free prisoners who they think were wrongfully convicted. So she started that. Um, and she headed it for about three years, her own project in Berkeley, which was the largest one in the country, but it ran out of money. And she switched gears after that and got into issues for women. Um, and so she was involved in the, I don't, I don't know how many of you know about Marvin versus Marvin, but Marvin versus Marvin was a Supreme Court case in California where Lee Marvin, the actor, was uh, sued by his live-in girlfriend um, for essentially the equivalent of, of uh, marital rights and property. And at the time, that was considered a relationship that was uh, immoral and the courts would not address it. And so she, she didn't work on that case, but she had another case like it while that was pending on appeal that gained national attention. Um, and that helped change the atmosphere and also the rulings. And so the Supreme Court came out with a new ruling saying times have changed. It's okay for people to live together without being married and they might be like a partnership and they share um, their, uh, what, what they have. Now that didn't work for her client and it didn't work for um, Lee Marvin's girlfriend because he actually had an existing wife at the time. And that was true of uh, uh, Faye Stender's client too. Yeah. Did you want to say anything about ultimately what happened to Faye Stender? I, I do. And I also will mention she worked very hard for le a lesbian um, adoptions, which were unheard of before that. And she headed a, uh, a, a California Women Lawyers panel um, that wrote a booklet on that that was distributed to judges throughout the state um, to galvanize uh, the acceptance of that kind of adoption. In 1979, which over Memorial Day weekend at her home in Berkeley, in the middle of the night, uh, someone knocked at her door, her son uh, uh, answered it. It was supposedly, it, it was a young woman standing there and she helped a lot of young people. And so he thought, okay, and she ran away. And instead there was a gunman and he came in and he wound up, he shot face Stender. Um, in her kitchen and left her for dead, execution style. She survived, uh, but she was in a wheelchair um, and in constant pain. Um, she was able to identify her assailant and she was the star witness for the prosecution at the trial the following uh, January and February um, of 1980. And then she fled to Hong Kong. He was, he was affiliated with a black guerrilla family um, gang and prison gang. She was afraid for her family and for her own life if she stayed in the country and she committed suicide. Thank you. I have two questions about George Floyd. Well, about the George Floyd trial. Uh, two people have asked, um, uh, about the whether the George Floyd trial, what you think about the George Floyd trial being should it be televised, we're watching video clips and so on, and kind of how you feel about that. And uh, someone else has asked in that connection, um, was the was Huey Newton's trial televised? Did it have the no? Did I didn't think so? Did it, it have the same it was did the international attention have any impact on the jury's decision? I'm not sure that the international um, coverage um, had an impact on the jury's decision, but they knew how important it was that they try to get it right. Um, as they were deliberating um, and throughout the trial, there were demonstrations on the outside of the courthouse 
And they had the first time in the history of the courthouse, they had high security yeah. uh, to get in. Um, and the jurors had to come in through the garage because uh, they didn't want them having to force their way through this uh, yeah. crowd. And they were saying, revolution has come, let's time to pick up the gun. Meanwhile, the police were on rooftops around the courthouse with rifles, with snipers. So yeah. they were anticipating violence and they thought that they just had to do uh, what uh, they believed was right and defend it. Yeah. Uh, so that was uh, there. There was no, uh, they had a courtroom sketches uh, by uh, more than one um, sketch artist. Uh, many of those uh, sketches on the one I showed you was a sketch done um, in the PowerPoint by a CBS sketch artist. Um, there's a collection of those at Cal now uh, that her family donated, Rosalie Ritz. Uh, but uh, in 1935, um, which is another case that I've ri just written about, the Lindbergh kidnapping, they had cameras in, in the courtroom, so they sneaked in. They had a mic in the courtroom sneaked in, and they showed the film footage across the country, and it was a scandal. And for many years after that, courts would not allow any um, uh, cameras in the courtroom. And uh, that was true in 68. Um, so that didn't happen. You just had the sketch artist in the courtroom and they showed the sketches on TV later that day. They covered it very closely, but not with uh, cameras. I have mixed views of cameras in the courtroom. It depends on the situation. I think in this case, there's so much interest and people want to know what's really going on inside that courtroom. You get much more buy-in when there's transparency. Uh -huh. I, I want to just take one minute to say a couple people have told me, reminded me, it is not the George Floyd trial. It's the Derek Chauvin oh, trial. Right, it is. It is about it's, his- I said that and I apologize to people. They're absolutely, completely right. Uh, there is a question here about um, Erica Huggins' trial in New Haven. Um, you were at Yale when the Black Panther co-founder Bobby Seale and Erica Huggins, who was a New Haven Panther, went on trial for murder. Do you want to say a little bit about the- Absolutely. Um, it, it, it was something that the whole campus was uh, totally um, aware of and um, some of us got involved in. Uh, I The only thing I did at that time is I went door to door um, asking people about the presumption of innocence um, because the uh, defense team, which was headed by Charles Gary, um, wanted to uh, to see whether they could get a change of venue or you know how they could gauge the community uh, on that issue. Um, and they wound up uh, with uh, like 1500 potential jurors and it was a very costly proceeding and, and uh, both um, uh, Erica Huggins and uh, Bobby Seal were tried together and they got a hung jury 10 to two. Um, so um, she came out to California shortly thereafter and Bobby Seale came um, out to California. But I did watch a little bit of the pretrial proceedings. I wasn't there at the trial itself. Mm -hmm. And that was when Kingman Brewster said he didn't think that a black revolutionary, black militant could get a fair trial anywhere in the country. Yeah, yeah. I think we're running out of time here and we want to leave time uh, for the trailer. So Lisa, I want to ask you one last question. It, are there things you want to tell us that you haven't told us yet and that haven't come up in the questions? Uh, yes, I do. Just give me a second here where I, I put my notes. Um, I think that the um, situation we have um, in America today um, with people, with diversity being um, an issue embraced by one party and uh, essentially white supremacy uh, embraced by another um, is a very challenging time that we all need to um, uh, be involved in, in addressing because uh, our democracy um, is at stake. And uh, I, I wanted to remind people that Stacey Abrams, who is another Yale uh, uh, law grad, um, uh, produced a phenomenal result over 10 years. She and her campaign manager worked for 10 years uh, to achieve what they achieved in Georgia, getting people um, to be able to vote. And it's at risk now, um, there and elsewhere. And so I encourage people to get involved in protecting our democracy and in promoting diversity 
uh, as much as you can, because I think that that's the answer to both the justice system and, um, and to a healthy democracy. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you for being so forthcoming, answering those questions. I think we might have time if you can keep this answer to this one very short uh, and still be on time for the, uh, for the clip. Um, uh, do you, face standards sounds so remarkable to me. I'm a gender studies person. So hearing about you know, a kind of strong, amazing woman with such such a diversity of causes that she worked on. Does she have anything, tell us anything about this in the Me Too era that we should take forward with us? Um, yes, because um, in uh, she was um, deeply uh, involved with her clients. She didn't consider herself just to have a lawyer-client relationship. Um, and she suffered greatly um, from, uh, from that. There are a couple of things. I, I will mention Charles Gary as well, because if he had his way, she would have been a sidekick for the rest of her career. So she left his practice and started with a, a collective, a law collective in Berkeley, um, the after the trial. Um, but, uh, with Huey Newton and George Jackson, uh, she, uh, was rejected in a very humiliating public fashion by Huey Newton. Um, after he was released from prison and that affected her deeply. And she was physically and emotionally um, uh, distraught um, as a result of the near fatal attack by a follower of George Jackson. And, and some of that had to do, uh, it, it was because she was female um, and because she had uh, gotten too close um, to both of them um, in a non-professional way. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to Heidi now, and I think we're going to be ready to watch um, watch the trailer for your ongoing film project. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jean and Judge Perlman. Um, so much information to absorb. I find myself processing it and integrating it with what I've heard recently, of course, in the news. Um, so as Jean mentioned at this point, we're going to turn to Judge Perlman's documentary project. This is the six minute version of the sample that won the Berkeley Film Foundation Award. Um, please note too, that the production team expects to have a matching grant from the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation to help them get to completion, which is very exciting and very generous. generous. Um, they certainly welcome donations from any of you who would like to see the project completed. Um, Barbara Rabb is uh, with the foundation and she's gonna be joining us for a few seconds just after the clip also to speak more about that. Um, you can donate and sign up for the newsletter at AmericanJusticeOnTrial.com. And we'll of course send this link to you as well in the follow-up email. So with that, I'm gonna turn us to a clip of the new documentary or at least a sample of. The shooting happened in the heart of Oakland's ghetto. Officer John Fry was found fatally wounded from four gunshots. The suspect, charged with murder and attempted murder, is Huey Newton. It's been a long, long, long time. Long, long, the long-awaited decision in the Huey Newton murder trial, which has drawn worldwide... So thank you, Lisa. That is an amazingly powerful, enticing sample. Could you spell uh, out a little bit more about what your um, work has involved in creating that and what your intention is? And then I know you wanted to, to also bring in a guest that you have this evening. Well, the intention is to create a, a film that we can share with uh, high school students, college students, law students, uh, and the general public at, at, at film festivals, as well as maybe on PBS, um, about the power of diversity, uh, that diverse jury um, was able to reach a result that avoided riots, 
um, that we have the uh, input from Karen Jo Coonan, who is a jury consultant, national jury consultant, about the uh, fact that diverse juries take longer to analyze things and uh, are more uh, focused on the evidence. Um, it's not because they don't have prejudices, it's because they tend to conceal them. That if you're dealing with people who are different from you in a, an environment where you're all supposed to reach a decision, you're more likely to focus on the evidence before you than to articulate any prejudice that you may have. And as a result, they reached verdicts that are more defensible. Um, and that is a model for how to address uh, the persistent issues with our justice system. Uh, the discretionary decision making should be made in a more collaborative fashion and with more uh, participation by various um, elements in the community. And that hadn't happened for 200 years um, in the jury, essentially, um, in a death penalty case until this one jury um, was uh, able to um, reach a result that avoided riots in a very volatile time um, and is a model for what we have today to deal with, to address. Great, wow. So that, that's what we're trying to achieve. I was able to talk over 40 different um, civil rights champions across the country into being on our honorary committee. We're very proud of the people who serve on that. Um, Brian Stevenson is one. Uh, Barry Sheck is co-chair along with Eva Patterson of the Equal Justice Society. Uh, some law school deans, uh, 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 Stanley Nelson, the filmmaker, Abby Ginsburg, another filmmaker who's been a consultant all along. Uh, it's been wonderful to have the input of all of them, our mayor, um, because they care so much. And Rob Bonta was one, and he's going off our committee now because he's about to be um, considered for attorney general for the state of California. Um, so it's been um, a wonderful experience and people um, recognize um, how important it is. Uh, the people who are involved in our project, our board, a couple of members of whom I think are on this call. Um, and uh, it's just, um, uh, it's the importance of the project that has driven this. And one of the things that's been delightful is meeting David Harper, who's still around. He's in his late 80s. Uh, and he did risk his life to serve on that jury. It's pretty profound. Now, you mentioned that you're in the final stages of fundraising, um, hopefully yes. the final stages, right? I know these projects can seem endless. And um, somebody from the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, Rebecca Robb, or excuse me, Barbara Robb is here tonight. Um, I'm, you yeah. briefly introduce her? I'm, I'm delighted to introduce Barbara Robb. She is the Senior Program Advisor for the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation. We have just um, been working with them recently and we're very excited about their uh, prospect of a matching grant and she would like to uh, give the word to the attendees about that, I think, right now. Uh, yes, hi, thank you so much, Lisa, that was a great presentation, and Heidi, thank you so much for just giving me a moment here to, um, to just say that, yeah, the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation is based in Berkeley, and uh, we have been talking with Lisa and her team about uh, coming in to support this film because it is um, largely done and just needs to get over the finish line. And so what we've been, what we're doing is, is challenging uh, Lisa and her team to match a $50,000 uh, grant from our foundation. And so um, I just wanted to say that if anybody here uh, is interested, I hope that you will help to meet that challenge. We, um, we fund a number of different kinds of projects, including documentary films that have social justice and social change at their core. And we really think that this film, for all the reasons that you've heard tonight, really has the potential to do that, not only by telling the interesting tale or story of Huey Newton, but all the things we've been talking about when it comes to juries and um, the difference that it can really make literally between life and death. Uh, you know, talk about change, that it would is a really, big kind of change that could happen. And we think this film could be part of uh, sparking that. So thanks a lot for the platform, just to say, I hope that some of you will join us in supporting the film and it will be just a matter of certainly under a year before we think that this film will be out there and it couldn't be more timely. So thanks so much.
Well, thank you, Barbara. And it's true, we have a rough cut and we're eager to complete it this year. And thanks to Andy uh, Abrams Wilson, who is our director, he's done a phenomenal job. Wonderful. Well, at this point, I know you all have um, been attentive. Jean, did you have any last questions or comments that you wanted to ask uh, before we go ahead and say good evening? I just I want to add my thanks um, to Lisa for being with us tonight and, you know, sharing a wonderful presentation and telling us the news about the film as well. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Judge Perlman. And uh, thanks to everybody who was joining us this evening. Please, as a reminder, check your email. You're going to see a follow-up email to this um, with more information on uh, the website for the document uh, documentary. And, and also for those of you who are Yale alumni, you'll have an opportunity to find your local chapter, sign up and uh, participate, if you will, in future events. So we look forward to being in touch with you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Good night.